you, okay. you know what? I just I just made a connection. You're to sell. You're just you're to sell reunion summit to sell. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I I think I saw you in the chat, and I was like, "Is that yourself?" I that think that's yourself from Union Summit. Where is she? And then I just saw your name on there. So sorry, I just put it together. Wow. Also from Alphabetic. Yes, great, great to meet you, dear. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen. Make sure everybody can see it. See <laughs> screen two. Okay, share. Can everybody see screen two now? It's yeah. Yes. yes. There it goes. Yeah. Now All we're right. good. All right. Hey. So, so here's what we're going to do here. So we're starting on chapter 12. And chapter 12 is on instinct. Um, we've, there's three, for the newer people, there's three portions to the book. There's part one, part two, and part three. Part one is omniscience. Part two is omnipresent, I think, and part four is omnipotent, or it could be the other way around. But right now we're in omniscience, which is all about the mind and thinking and, and um, how that happens. And again, it's all Walter Russell's view from the secret of light. So within chapter 12 on instinct, it says, what does organic matter purely generate from so when we talk about organic matter we talk about everything that we see so on from page 65 from the desire of mind to manifest idea into matter desire is the motivating force of all creation so what this is saying if you guys remember back to my original drawing here that I did from some of the other concepts, we have the biggest thing to, to, to garner from this is that we have God's mind into matter. So that's this whole little clouded area. We, we would think, okay, this is, you know, there is no actual border to it. We're saying this is God's mind. And we have cause, and then we have effect. And what Walter Russell has said is that man gets too caught up in the effect and doesn't really understand the cause. And if we understood the cause more related to cause more, we could actually affect, we could actually affect and influence the effect. So with that being said, we have God's imagining here. It starts out here is the mind of God as these two sect lights, which are magnetic. And then it goes into man and then it goes into his thinking, which turns into color, which then turns electric and turns into matter. So with that being said, we just had a question regarding desire from the desire of mind to manifest idea into matter. Desire is the motiva motivating force of all creation. So if you look at this, where does desire come from? Does it come from the mind? Does it come from the heart? Does it come from the stomach? Where, you know, we often, you know, it's my heart's desire to do this, or it's, where does desire actually come from? Any comments on that? Is desire like I want a boat or? Desire? What do you mean by desire? Yeah. Well, if we go back down here, this is what was, we talked about in chapter 10. This is where the correction is. So chapter 10, the centering conscious mind of man's soul will, so his soul will, alone thinks by projecting creative expression through the brain machine. Remember, we, we talked about how the brain's just a machine. It's not really us. We think it is, but it's not. Desire in mind is electrically expressed. Electricity is the motivating force which projects the one light two ways to create cycles of light waves for the purpose of expressing thought. Desire is not in the brain. It is the centering conscious self. Desire is the cause of all motion. And that's where I had the correction is that when I wrote chapter question four on chapter 10, and I do this quite a bit is where I get brain and mind kind of mixed up in terms. So the question was, what is it electrically expressed in the brain? And it should have been in the mind and causes all motion. And the answer is desire. Desire. Okay. All right. So if you go okay. back here and look at this, okay, 
So, you know, here is the still magnetic light universe of God's knowing, which is invisible. So does desire come from man or does desire come from God? It comes from both, right? Correct. I would say that is correct. We have God's desires and we have man's desires. So I want a boat, yeah. maybe man's desire, unless you're Noah. Then <laughs> 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 it could be God's desire. Uh, but we would, and that is this key is that as humans, we are trying to discern constantly between God's knowing desire and our car carnal or um, sensing desires. You know, do I need food? How much? I need, you know, to go to the smorgasbord. No, you don't. You can eat a peanut, you know. It could be God's desire <laughs> saying you need sustenance. I'm saying, no, I need a whole boatload, you know. So the difference between these two, but both of those things will manifest our reality. One will be a God-driven reality or a source-driven or a universe-driven reality. The other will be a driven materialistic reality. Any comments on that? I'm I curious. To make the picture bigger because... Um, Which one? The, this current one? The one that you're showing. I, I mean, I, I know it's because it's, uh, it's, it's kind of reduced. It's huge. Can you just hit fit to window that button right there next to Zoom? Okay, let's see if it the the one up here. That's, that's, that's the one uh, next to the Zoom button. You just clicked up in the top. Yeah, Zoom. Yeah. I got that. The one next to it. The one right next to it. This one? No, uh, close that, and then the right before you click Zoom. Yeah. So there's a Zoom button oh, that... right next. Yeah. I think that's. I can go to presentation, but that gets me to other things. Let's see here. That's huge for me. You have small monitors, maybe? No. So I can do this one. Is that any better? Well, no, we're seeing the quest. Well, okay, whatever. I mean, it's I was just. Smaller, you know? Yeah. I think it's better to go this way. To just zoom on the good. bottom right corner, the mm -hmm. little That's scroll good. bar thing. Oh, this one here? Yeah. Okay, there we go. There you go. Ah, there you go. Oh, look at that. It's huge. Okay, how's that? Is that better? Yeah, well, it's just that since. I mean, we've seen this diagram a lot, but there's a lot of new people. Yeah. I don't think they've seen this diagram that well yet. So I'm like, I don't know. I just thought it'd be nice to be bigger for now. And this is a diagram that I created myself. So wow. it was from a lot of different sources. Yeah, he did like, wow. He kept yeah. adding to it. <laughs> yeah. But this is amazing. What comes up for me is, how do we know the difference between God given, uh, God driven, and man driven? How yeah. how can I how can I better discern that? What what would your intuition say? Well, um, as a somatics kind of person, um, I, like I know the difference between I when I am moving my body and when there's you know spirit is moving through my body. Spirit's moving my body. So there's kind of like a, a felt sense, perhaps a felt sense knowing, but that was just the first kind of question that came up is mm -hmm. how do I, how do I know the difference? Um, it's, and, and what Walter Russell would say is that, as you would say, there is this knowing. And what's happening is, is that in the materialistic world, we're beginning to be told that our brain, right, is us. That as we think, as we do these things, that this brain is us. Hmm. And Walter Russell saying, no, that is not us. We are actually a consciousness and we have a knowing, but we've been told that we can't trust our knowing. And we yeah. have to go to the experts and the specialists and everybody else and be told what the truth is. But in our own minds, we know what knowing is. We always have, children know what knowing is but we've been kind of taught that we don't have that ability anymore to know. Well, I think not all of us, that's what we're here, right? Correct. Well, I, well, again, I'm still working on it. I still get caught up in fear and trembling and you know, oh, yeah. all, all those things. I'd be a liar to say I didn't. I just yeah. always thought there were liars though. <laughs> that's all I meant. And 
Yeah, and I think that, you know, Steiner talks about that you take the draft of forgetfulness when you come back into the world. Yep. It's a and, common thing. And, Go and off so, with amnesia. Yeah. And so uh, we know these things, and that's kind of what the Steiner schools or the anthroposophic schools do is try to cultivate the idea of clairvoyance, of going within. And I think we, when we talked about this poll on the causal plane, you know, where do we actually think we may have the best benefit to the earth? Is it in the physical, in our, you know, our doing, or is it in our, in our minds and in our manifestations, in our being? Okay. You know, as I've often said, we're not human doings, we're human beings. But we've gotten caught up into the doings and being told that being is not productive. Yeah, Steiner also said that you know, materialism had started you know, yeah. running crazy in 1850 or something, I mm -hmm. think was the date, is going to be dangerous. You know? mm -hmm. uh, he certainly read it right. <laughs> and so with this question, right? So from desire of mind to manifest idea into matter, desire is the motivating force of all creation. So once we get aligned with source and begin to intuitively seek, what we can manifest on the other side is all motion. We, ma we can manifest all doing through desire and knowing, not actually through movement and doing. Any comments on that? Seems like it would be all up in your head then. Well, again, it's not in your head. You are well, not in your head. Right. That's a mistake we make. Right. It's okay. In so it's in source. That's therein lies the fallacy that you're just speaking about. Correct. Right. Correct. Right. That. Right. That's where my head went. Was it? Oh, then it's all in your head, and then you're not really okay. So. We have to separate our thinking mind from our knowing mind. And so let's move on to the next question because some of these things may help with, with some, of the, uh, some of the questions. So what is given to each single cell of man as it unfolds? And the question is from page 65, memory of purpose, pattern of idea, as the desire of God's mind and man's idea desire work to, together to express the idea of form. In form. In form, okay. Thank you very much, Doug. In form. <laughs> so as we go back to this diagram, right, we know that this is incorrect, that desire does not come from any part really of man, right? Where it comes from is from God and then once it hits our consciousness, wherever that resides, right? It may, it probably, you know, it, it resides out here. It resides in the one. But once it hits our unique consciousness, which is made from many things, from our epigenetics, from our DNA, from our experiences, from everything we are, that then hits, makes this red blue shift that goes and then becomes into a spectrum, which then becomes into matter. So for each person, they may be seeing a different reality. But because of the re resonance and the desire and everything else, when, when we draw something and we see a picture, oh yeah, that's what I see, but that's just the resonance of the picture. It may not be exactly what you see, it may be something totally different because that's their reality. That's what they're seeing, that's what they're manifesting. Because each person manifests from the will of source or God through their unique filter, their projecting light, projected into matter. Because we all are one consciousness outside of our body. Our ego comes into play, which is our sensing body, which says we are separate and unique. And we are, our conscious is separate and unique, but our body is not, a man, is not us. We're not a bunch of little, um, we're more like 
uh, probes. We're more like a bunch of little God probes that were going out having sensations to manifest and create <laughs> God's desire in the 3D, in the physical. It's, it's the brainwashing that they've done because they know that they can't control us. So they have to get us to believe in this other story. Because they want to charge for our creations. Right, because we're capable of getting whatever we want. But when people are brainwashed, they, do the same, they all do the same thing. Now they're in control. So you can't get any control unless people do it. Give exactly, in. exactly. I mean, I suffered with beating myself up for so many years. I, not that I'm completely out of it, but now I recognize it from working on it. But it's, it's me. That's mm -hmm. the enemy. Well, not me, though. It's not me. That's the point. It is. Uh, it's you. It's just a manifestation of you that you have to learn how to deal with. And that's it. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. once. Like, well, not know, the body is what I should say. Yeah. But once we realize that we're all one and everything that we see, do, and smell to, is a manifestation of us in some manner, then we can actually instead of trying to change them, we change us, which then mm. changes our projection of them. For sure. I and mean, that's the struggle. Anyway. Yeah, I've always kind of grappled with this concept of like love and like light versus dark and how like the two strategies between the two, I know the, the darkness is inside of God. So I, I get that, that whole concept, but um, it's funny to look at the different strategies between like the light and the dark. The light will just kind of always stand and like embrace and the dark is kind of on on the front lines attacking. It's it's just kind of a so going back to what we're talking about with the desire and verse or desire and instinct being God's mind. Um, it just kind of brought me back to like, is that what love is? Is like this ever evolving like force that will just eventually like envelop the darkness or I don't know. Well, again, I've, like I said, you know, and we've had the discussion is that I worked with heart math where, you know, you do this, med you know, you do your meditation and you do breathing, but then you try to manifest love, you know, this feeling of love or compassion. And for me, it's like, what is love? You know, do I really know what love is? Can I, you know, well, visualize a person. Well, love for my dog versus love for a woman versus a love for my mother may all be different right, right? so which one do i concentrate on and, and what i'm beginning to what i'm beginning to kind of move toward mm -hmm. is the idea that once we realize that all is one that all outside is us why would you ever not love all that if you love yourself right you so love yourself though so by seeing somebody, seeing Bill Gates or whoever you might think is, you know, the incarnation of evil, realizing that that is just a manifestation of you. And if you were doing that, what would you do to be loving to that part of you? Cut it off. <laughs> I don't know. Vaccinate it. <laughs> there's, a, there, there's an old saying, you know, don't bite, you know, cut off your nose to spite your face, you know. So, yes, you can cut it off, but I don't know. Pick the wrong one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if anything is beneficial. Um, so, you know, what love is, is to actually understand that all is one and all is a part of us. And there is no separateness because once we begin to call that evil and that good, and I'm not saying that people don't do bad things. That's not what I'm saying. There are people doing bad things, but once we begin to separate out and say, that's not me, that's not me. I'm good. You're bad. It a lot. I think it's more difficult it, and it causes us trauma. That, and that's where our trauma becomes because we're now trying to fight this idea and we become traumatized by it rather than realizing it is part of us. Okay. Again, I'm not, again, I'm not saying there are bad things don't happen to good people or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. They do happen, but are they for our benefit or are they for our detriment? Are they for our growth or are they for, you know, and we have, if, if what Walter Russell's saying true and we're manifesting all of this, then we've manifested everything in our life. There is no evil manifestation. There is no good manifestation because, I mean, I've seen people say, I'm working, you know, again, and again, I love Lord of the Rings. It gets back to Gandalf, you know. If I was to put the ring on it, I would try to do so much good that I would become so evil and tyrannical, right? 
thinking that I'm doing good. You know, I, I just, because it's like, I'm wanting my will to be done. I'm, I think that I'm God and I'm trying to tell everybody else what is right and what is wrong. Rather than tr trying to have God flow through me and becoming an instrument of the, the universe's purpose. And money is a great example in our society, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's 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 been used to quantify our doings and to um, you know then capture us into having that be our desire. And we forget about the knowing. And then we also think that our money can solve problems when that's not really the case. We may get we may get comfort and relief through wealth. I don't know if we get satisfaction and peace through it. We sure get a lot of distraction with it right now. Mm -hmm. mm. All this, well. I'm just saying, you know, <laughs> if we keep focusing on that, we're not going to focus on the right stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying. Yeah. So that is what is being said within this pattern of idea as a desire of God's mind and man's idea desire work to the, work together to express the idea in form so mm -hmm. we get a desire from god we have our own desire so the desire from god may be hey wouldn't it be nice to grow you know some food and then man's desire may be oh yeah i can grow some food oh and then i can make some money off of it you know and then he's going to take that into a rejection that may or may not be healthy for mankind as a whole or he can be aligned and let, let's get back to the next one. What, what, what is what do you think about the single cell of man, though? Well, let's talk a little bit about that. So let's look at the next question. How do the concept of archetypes and forms of Plato and Jung relate to Russell's concepts, idea of form and cell memory? Wow. OK, so is are, are, are you familiar with Plato and, and Jung? I'm not familiar with Jung. Okay. I know they keep talking about it. Plato a bit. Okay, so, so the form, cave. yeah, we'll call forms and archetypes. Okay. Okay. So this is this, this, this verbiage I have right here actually came from just the internet. And I kind of want to, I put it up because it does basically describe things, but it also has some errors and how it's presented, but it's more of what is actually happening in today's um, uh, world. world. Thank you. Simply put, an archetype is a set pattern of behavior. Plato referred to archetypes as forms, which he saw as pre-existing ideal templates or blueprints. So an archetype would be the wise old man, you see a guy with a beard, older guy, he's the wise old man. When I write a book about the wise old man, everybody understands what the wise old man is. It's a part of our makeup. We think it may be from learning, but not everybody learned that. But there is this concept, this ideal concept of the wise old man. There's a, you know, archetype of the king, of the wizard, you know, of the, of the queen, of the, of the princess, of, of the villain, you know, of the warrior, of the knight. These are all archetypes, images that Russell is saying are imprinted in us when we're born. Okay, okay that, that all humans would have these concepts within them. Yeah, actually all sentient beings would have them in them. All, all sentient beings would have all of them in us. Yes, so, so they would have, even a plant would have these concepts of king and so on. These are archetypal to our consciousness, to the collective unconscious. They're just part of us. They'd be part of our genetic makeup. They'd be transferred from person to person. And so, so archetypes is what Carl Jung, so 
Plato was the first. He's the one that came and said, but he called them forms. So there's these different forms, right? And so we have these forms of these ideas. Carl Jung comes back later and does his own spin because he wants to get paid for it. He says, okay, we're going to call them archetypes are what Carl Jung called primordial images. So he's put a little spin on it. See, Plato referred to them as ideal, the ideal template, mm -hmm. to where Jung's calling them primordial images. So he's kind of tearing it down a bit. There's no ideal. It's more of just a primordial images, but there still are the same pretty much archetypes of king, queen, so and that's what old man, old woman, uh, you know, those type of things, father, mother, all these things are archetypes that, that young, and it's part of depth psychology. So, I mean, it's been accepted, you know, uh, people are moving away from depth psychology more into behavior, but that's a whole different question of theory. So, so, so every character you see on television and in the film represents an archetype. And I say, well, you know, it may represent a Jungian type archetype, a villain, you know, a hero, uh, king queen but are they ideal templates right <laughs> back <laughs> back to plato they may not be ideal and that's where we get into you know uh you know wife looks at her husband and says i have an archetypal image of a husband he's perfect you're not what's going on <laughs> right same thing with a husband to a wife right i have an idea of you know ideal wife that i have this in my mind of what a wife should be but and this can be influenced. We will have the, the ideal image, but that can be influenced by overlays, lifestyle, so on and so forth. So virtually every response you give to your environment, the way you behave is an expression of an archetype too. Almost all human behavior is guided by archetypes. And I would really say from what Russell's saying, it would not be almost all. It would be all human behavior is guided by archetypes. And then what Carl, this is a statement from Young. So Archetypes are the living system of reactions and aptitudes that determine the individual's life in invisible ways. Mm. Okay, and so that's a quote from Carl Jung. Reactions and aptitudes. Any, any comments or questions on that, on archetypes and what they are and, and their basis? Again, this is very, very general. I mean, there's much more to it than this. I just kind of put it up there to give people an overall understanding. It's Jordan Peterson's type type stuff, no? Correct. It's a lot. I mean, again, it's it's, it's a lot of people. And it, I mean, it's Russell. Russell's talking about yeah. these things. Um, but he was not the first. And, and we're going to get into how, actually how old they are. They're like energetic and um, consciousness um, patterns. Mm -hmm. Right, they're imprints. Like yeah, they're they're, in, they're they're res they're, they're resonant imprints. Resonant on, imprints. Yeah, on, on our DNA. I like yes. that resonant imprint. You what you just said there. Yeah, that it's not written up there. You just said that right now, right? <laughs> said right now. Yeah, yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Right, that's like brilliant. Resonant imprints. Yeah, that's it, very cool. Of wow. of like kind of like of 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 a of like all of the life forms that have lived before us, all the archetypal mm -hmm. life forms and that reservoir of archetypes is from our collective lived experience, something like that. Well, what is, what is, what is, what is, the, what is the topic of this chapter? Forms and archetypes. Instinct, you said instinct. Instinct, instinct correct. Is that instinct? Yes. So, so, what, instinct? so what are archetypes? <laughs> Well, it's like programs that we're going to repeat when, exactly. you know, when things, when we hear a, a bear, what are we going to do? Mm. We're going to run or we're going to do this. And, or... and, and we can look and we can look around at nature and say, oh, these birds are returning to where they, you know, um, were born or these salmon can go back to their spawning. But for us, we don't think we have any of that. We don't think we have any instinct, right? Besides, yeah, we, have some. We, have, we have more than we think. Right, <laughs> we have a lot more than we think. But we're lost. That we've been told, right? Yes. So it's they're all lost. Just like with the instinct of birds, it's a resonant imprint of, of that area of that GPS location. You know of where they were, where whales spawn, the whole thing. We we have that all imprinted within us. We're just told we don't because if we do have that memory and consciousness, and we do find it 
we would have a different life than we have now. So are you controllable? Thanks. Go ahead, Paul. Are you using resonant imprints and instincts kind of um, synonymously? Correct. Correct. Wow. It's like a reef. It, that's a. Well, we're going to get into a little bit more. We're going to get into a little bit of Sheldrake and Morphic Resonance here. Oh, second. great. Okay. Yeah, that's that's really insightful because like, yeah. we have all these resonant imprints or archetypes, <laughs> archetypal forces within us at all times in different stages of our life, like evoke different, um, more intense um, variations of these or maybe. So like, for example, my life, I've changed like I've seen a different like archetype primal archetype like ruling my life at different stages of my life as I go through it mm -hmm. and it's just really interesting to um look at it from the standpoint of like these whenever they're fighting or causing conflict it's really just trying to um invoke your true power because you're probably hiding from your power mm -hmm. or you're you're falsifying your power making it like you, you know like true power doesn't need to like prove itself it just mm -hmm. It, it's, it shows itself by its like authenticity or just by its presence. Like, I don't know, and I'm going with that. But. Totally well, authentic. Yeah, well, archetypes are cyclical too. So, I mean, you can have a, you know, a well, six-year-old girl who is actually maybe presenting as the wise old woman because she has some insight, but she's not truly the wise old woman totally. And you may have a wise old woman who is presenting that, archetype of the child that'd be my mother <laughs> <laughs> i'm not going to comment on uh, sorry I sorry i couldn't help it it's just up right now <laughs> my grandmother used to always say once to man twice to child so uh I, I i wouldn't disagree with that and there are times and there's very like rites of passage like for men it's it's difficult for a man to go from the knight to the king it's difficult for a, you know for him to stop serving women and actually begin to command because he's so used to the maternal and the kind of like the journey and I want to be a knight and I want to you know be these things and so for a man to go from knight to king is a tough thing to do same thing for a woman from a princess to a queen very difficult rite of transition within the archetypal patterns so we have cycles that go on. People don't aren't always in one or the other. They can vacillate back and forth. The idea is to actually, you know, resonate and recognize what archetypal pattern am I in, and is that appropriate for where I'm at in my stage or cycle? There's nothing wrong with a woman, you know, who's 90 years old being a child. It's fun. It's playful. But is it detrimental to where I'm at in the situation I'm in at the time, or is it beneficial? So within archetypes and biogeometry, and the reason I bring this up, because I know that I want to talk more about biogeometry, and I know more people are interested in it. So I want to set some frameworks for the archetypes in biogeometry um, as we move forward. So that uh, if we do discuss it, those, you know, and it kind of makes this material more relevant to what Russell was saying to what's actually going on today. And there are other luminaries, like I do believe that Jung and Plato are, were luminaries, they have things to offer and people have built other work on them. That's why I bring them up. So within archetypes and biodramatry, this is this is what um, Abraham Kareem, this is a quote from, from my study material that was handed out at class. It's the coherent spiritual relationship the Egyptians had with spiritual forces came about because the connection they maintained in their civilization with the divine archetypal levels. It was a relationship the imperfect seeking perfection through the perfect. So that's this is more of the Platonic idea, right? The perfect, the archetype is the perfect. Through this link, the community had a constant connection with the force, with the source, with the universe, with God, whatever you want to call it, which has a profoundly stabilizing healing and inspirational effect on the community and its members. It is only when the community's link with the archetypal level was compromised or severed due to the emergence of a new materialistic paradigm that the civilization begins the road to spiritual and social decline. Mm. So 
you know, getting back to this top where I just took it out of, you know, Wikipedia or whatever, so somebody that wrote it was, you know, er every character you see on television and in films represents an archetype. Is that true or is that a manifestation of an archetype that someone wants us to believe is an archetype? Both, I think. I would say it's a lower version. I mean, it's not true to the ideal, uh, you know, or the prim primordial images, like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's come down, way down. Like, I always said that television was dumbing people down. Like, I, you know, and so, I gave, okay, anyway. Yeah. So our ideal of, of I, the idea of ideal has now been thrown out the window. There is no ideal that everything's okay. Everything can, can now again, what is written down here was written by Ibrahim Karim, right? Um, you know, is this true, right? Well, again, so civilization is cyclical. And it's like with stocks, they nothing go, keeps going up. There's times for growth and there's times for stabilization. There's time. For, so are, is there a time for a rebirth of archetypes? Just as we said with the wise old woman and the child, I mean, is there a time that maybe archetypes change? Or do we, or it is because as we talked about with God, that the still magnetic light universe of God's knowing, which is invisible, unchanging, unconditional, and unmeasurable. Can you see this here? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any comments on that? Well, you said luminaries at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, at, at the beginning of each age, which, you know, we are in now, the sound of, of the best, like love, yeah, has to sound again. So we will call for many luminaries to come. They are here and there's more to come, but, you know, so that we can, well, we can create the new, uh, and yes, those crystallization those forms that are decaying now will be replaced renewed if you like so i keep thinking about this magnetic light there i, I think something similar giselle it the first thing that came up for me is still magnetic light you know it, it comes up is that is that just uncon that's just love is is that what, that could just be a, a field of pure love? Pure reason, mm -hmm. you know, pure love. Uh, and again, it's what, you know, what is love? And, um, you know, like I said, when I do this meditation and we got to, and I got to concentrate on love, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what is that? I mean, is it, you know, giving a hundred percent of myself to where there is no more of me? Is that really love? Well, it's not loving myself, right? My, be loving somebody else or it might be somebody else's idea of love is it giving away all my money to somebody who gonna take it and buy drugs and booze no that's not love right it's it saying yes all the time is it being nice is it never losing my temper you know um you know forrest gump said it pretty good you know i may not be a smart man but i know what love is <laughs> <laughs> Well, you said at the beginning about mm -hmm. that everything is, well, I don't think it was exactly like this, but I was thinking of um, the law of one that we keep seeing mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. uh, on Edgar Casey mm -hmm. or like we're, we've been posting stuff on that in alphabetics. So I'm thinking, yeah, like it could be, well, that law of one, it's, that could be what love is because then we don't see the separation anymore. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so that love is not really anything that we've been taught, though, as love, right? That's not a concept that we've ever really been taught of as love, as everything is one. We've actually been taught that 
to, to love is to actually see people's separation, to see their, their race, their gender, their sex, and all the, to see all the separate things about them, rather than to actually see the commonalities, that we're all humans, that we all have hearts, we all have bodies, we all eat food, all these things that make us similar, we don't see those things. And we concentrate on the separate, not, not on the oneness. So any more on that? Um, the other thing that we're going to talk a little bit about here, let's see, where do I have that one at? Oh, that's down here. So the next question is, what is the source of any desire of man? And from page 65, any desire of man is a two-way extension of the light idea from God to man. So we've kind of covered this a bit back to this diagram here of this two sex of the yin and the yang, the two sex light, the dark and the light coming forth as this magnetic pulse. This pulse is actually desire. It's being sent out to mm. the co consciousness of man. Any comments on that? When do we introduce, you know, how you have other diagrams to do with the Taurus? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's only at the fulcrum in the middle. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just wondering. Well, I, you know, I have these diagrams here. That yeah. We talk about with, with the fulcrum. And, you know, but I'm going to wait a little bit because we're going to start yeah. talking about the law. And that's what okay. I'm going to get into that. Right now, I'm kind of just setting okay. the groundwork for desire. So basically, what you know, what's being said here is that all desire comes from God to man um, of the light of the idea. So it's the light. So this, <laughs> this is kind of the secret of light, right, that, that we've been talking about. Um, can man create whatever he desires? And from page 66, only if the God in him co-creates with God according to universal law. So if we look at this, let's see here, where's that at? That's not it. Universal law, right? So is, are people aware of universal law and how that differs from natural law? I'm not. Well, universal law was seven universal laws at a glance that were, from what I can find, I mean, again, I'm no expert in it, I'm, but it's basically there's seven laws that kind of came from Sir Isaac Newton. And so you have the law of attraction or vibration, the law of perpetual transmutation, the law of rhythm, the law of relativity, the law of polarity, the laws of cause and effect, and the law of gender. So these were the laws, okay. the seven laws that I think that Russell's talking about, because he does refer later on to the law of, of polarity and the laws of cause and effect. Uh, and the law of vib attraction or vibration is kind of what I talked about when I said it's the, it's the resonance that we feel, right? The resonance resonance signature that we have because as you look at these laws here um, you can look at what <clears throat> these are some diagrams from Russell where he says this is the law right positive electrical electricity is a force generated against pressure resistance positive intensity increases with contra con contraction due to pressure resistance and streams flowing in positive directions, positive electricity is the accumulation of absorbing and uh, accumulating, absorbing end of hermetic force of contraction, which seeks higher pressures. And then it talks about the, in the negative force, right? So within this, you have magnetic flow that come in, you have contraction, you have expansion, 
You have inhalation, you have exhalation. So this is the cosmic pendulum that Giselle was just asking about. Oh, cool. The inhalation, the exhalation, the breath work. The mm. breath of God. You have like high resins of these? This is the highest ones I got. No, I mean, to, if you can, if I can get them to print. Yeah. I mean, I have a print shop. I, I so, so creation is but a swing of the cosmic pendulum from inertia through energy and back again to inertia forever and forever. It mm -hmm. is but a series of opposing pulsations of action and reaction, integration and disintegration, gravitation and radiation, appearance and disappearance. Wow. Okay, so, you know, as we see the swinging, right, back and forth, we, we think of it as life and death, but it's just a continuation of a cycle. It's just a continuation of the cycle of life and death, of appearance and disappearance. Hmm. Is that why when scientists look, and I'm not one of those, but that look into the atom and, and they, they keep calling one thing after another, oh, well, we've just discovered another element and then, hmm. well, it disappears and it appears. And it's it's that kind of picture. Of hmm? Yes, it's, it's, part of, it's part of the law of this inhalation and exhalation. And exactly. And, you know, you know, and within this, you know, up here you have what, you, may, you know, the zero through one. So, you know, it could be looked at the moon phases even, you know, you go back to zero again and you start back, you know. And so each of these things, as you get to them, so this is the sine wave right here. So if we look at, you know, this right here, right, mm -hmm. this is the sine wave. This is the appearance, right, goes to a peak like the moon, right, new mm -hmm. moon. Full moon, new moon, right? It doesn't go, the, the, the cycle isn't new moon, new moon, right? It's new moon, full moon, new moon, and then goes back again. And one mm -hmm. side's light and one side's dark, separated by the sine wave, the wave of creation. So within this, we have the mind right here. See, there is but one cosmic substance, that's mind all there is everything is mind and we manifest through our consciousness into matter and so with on this one which is very similar to this chart which is, but this actually says evolution right is the con concentrative desire of mind to create the idea of many substances out of the one so if we go back here that is the spectral light here the many substances from these substances, they all correlate with color just as right here. Mm -hmm. So the mind in motion universe in the center, you have yellow, green, blue, blue, violet, axis of gravity, male, orange, red, red, violet, axis of gravity. You got female and male here. I think female is actually over here. So you got magnetic white light, magnetic white light. Where's the radioactive? I thought it was radiation and gravity. I always get confused with that. Well, the, a, a concentration and disintegration is, gra is gravity. It's the same thing. I mean, this evolution and dissolution. So evolution would actually be concentration, be gravity. Mm -hmm. Dissolution is the decentrative. So if you look over here, it says negative electricity is uh, force radiate. So it's ah. radiation. So these are the same, and I th again, I think a little bit, and I don't know if, you know, if both these were done by Russell or they're done at different times, but I do know that Russell had started out as, you know, one force being positive, one force being negative. And then when Leo came into play, she said, well, I'm not negative, you know? And so we got two positive forces. So I don't know if the, the terms and, you know, over time may have changed or if, you know, um, these are different diagrams, but they're basically the same diagram showing different things. This is more showing the substances, right? This, these are seven different substances. So the seven different substances are actually the octaves. So when you go back and look at this diagram here, you actually see under the colors, right? You have the do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Ah. 
So they mm -hmm. all align also with tones and sounds. It, was it helium or hydrogen that he said wasn't just one thing and it was an right. octave, I think. It, it, right? Well, if you, if you look here, here's also, uh, yes. blow, let me blow this up just a bit so mm -hmm. you guys can actually see it better. Will you I get all confused? Uh, Definitely confused. Me. Okay, so can you guys see this better now? Oh, yeah. So the gravity center of every ring is its center of mind control. Electric potential and gravity are 90 degrees in opposition. This mind and motion universe, right? So you have magnetic white light, magnetic white light. Then you have the color spectrum, yellow, orange, red, red, violet, right? Those come down and actually are the periodic table of elements. Those then come down and also form the notes. I thought like helium is bad though, like negative or something. No, no, no they're, th th these are what I think Bear calls, I forget what he calls them, the primary elements or something, or, um, the sh shadow elements. He, he has a certain name for them that they're like are the basis of creation. He's, he's, I'm, I'm not a good chemist. I'm just starting to take chemistry. So it's not really my specialty. I'm more of a physical guy. So um, I am beginning to learn. He just talked about it in the last alpha class. Did he? Well, sorry, in the, in the, the, the co-op co meeting, because he, he had to answer some questions. Of, well, he wanted to answer some mm. questions about fluvic and, you know, the zero point. Mm. And so he went into the elements, like mm. he talked. He used the words that he uses, which I can't say right now, but I'm saying it's those elements you're talking about, or why are they so good for us? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, anyway. So, you know, they're all octaves. Even the colors an octave, the periodic table is an octave, and the sound, of course, is an octave on a scale. Could you call this like al alchemy? Uh, well, is Alchemy is a bit different. I mean, we do. I, I, I've just taken alchemy, and alchemy is actually is the separation of biomatter into returning it to spirit, soul, and body, breaking it all down, and then killing it basically, and then resurrecting it as you put it all back together again to form medicine. So it's a bit different, but you do have elements and so on. Um, so it was it was alchemy actually that. Dr. Lando talked about on the at the co -op meeting. Yeah, I wish yeah, I should have been there because I would have. I mean, it. exactly what you just said. He described the whole thing. Yeah, how he could it creates his formulas. You know, his products. So, this is a picture, which Neat. is is called the breath of life. So this is from native traditions of mother, creator blowing the breath. So this is spirit. This is life creating matter, which is a different concept in materialism, which is matter creates life, right? That you have a, a, a parasite or bacterium or single cell organism that then gets consciousness. And what Walter Russell is saying is that you have consciousness right. and that begets life. So it's the opposite of materialism. And with that, um, we also, oh shoot. It's kind of big. Let me see here, what we got? Why don't you let me do it? Yeah, here we go. So what with- word cosmology? I, I never understand that word. Cosmology, it's kind of, I don't know. It's kind of like, I call it cosmology. It could be cosmology, yeah. the idea. Oh. So within this, you have gods, right? So what's the difference between God's and man's cosmology? What's the most apparent difference here? You have the body. No, let's maybe look at these squares. Is there anything different in these squares? Oh, there's two positives and a negative and positive. Correct. So within man's cosmology, just as Leo said, there is no negative. There's only two positive charges. You mean in gods? In gods. In man's, we have a positive and a negative. Hmm. 
So there are no such effects in nature as negative charge or negativity charge particle. Electricity in nature's sex force is male and female. So what's the negative, uh, the devil? No, it's actually, it'd be an anti-charge, which there is, it's, it's really more of how man sees it. So again, that's, see, that's the problem is that when we say negative, when we have these overlays and archetypes of what negative is, right? Why is it bad, right? Is it yeah, bad? I mean, yeah, you know, and that's what Leia was kind of caught up on. She don't want to be called negative. Well, you know, then say male, female, say whatever you wish, but it's the connotation, it's the euphemism of the whole thing. It's the overlay that we may put with it. Um, so we, we have this here as God's magnet, right? Again, man, woman. But we talked a little bit about this with biological ionization yesterday, right? Of it going, going. In God's cosmogony, there are the electrical dividers of stillness into curved planes of equipotential potential electric pressures. So this may be one of the reasons that we don't, that you can discredit flat earth and go back to spheres because there is this, this curvature that happens uh, within the creation. And so, you know, we constantly have this radiation and decentration within, within um, Russell's cosmogony. So is, is Russell a um, globe guy? He talks much about spheres, yes. So would he, would, does he ever come out and say that Earth is a um, globe? Well, again, if you look at, he talks that things are, that are created in spheres and then compressed into squares. So. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, so if you look at this one right here, if you look at this, you know, this room, in God's cause, there are the electric dividers of stillness into curved planes of equal potential. So, you know, what are you getting here? Right. Positive. And we're getting a sphere. I mean, this is brought out would become a sphere, right? But it's not a physical piece of matter necessarily, is it? Well, it is because all matter is, is energy. All, all matter is, is the interplay between these two, right? Back to this diagram. All matter is, is the interplay between these two. What do you think, Will? Do you think it's flat, or do you think it's or we're we're spherical? Well, the Earth. For, for, uh, to me, it's you know, oh, wow. and, uh, for me, I, I I say it's what I'd say round, just because it makes more sense from everybody I study. And does it make any difference to me? Not really. Um, mm. It's not. I mean, I'd much rather manifest my round. And I think I was talking to Grant about this earlier. Is that within my world now, it doesn't matter whether or not history is true or not. It's what has yeah. been manifested in thought. It's like, you can, you can debate whether or not Jesus was a real person or not. Well, there's enough people who believe he was that now he's real because he's been manifested in mind that he's real, right? It doesn't really matter if he was or not. What matters is, is what is the current manifestation by most people? But it does influence how you think about things. So, like, you can't just say that it it doesn't influence it. Wow. It does. You don't even think about things. You think about things completely differently based on like those two different um, bases of truth. Because those fundamental bases of truth build all the other well, ideas. Again, there's no way to prove it, right? Really. And so, if, if I say that, um, you know, that Achilles was a false person and he's not real does that mean that he wasn't real well some people may know achilles better than they know their own parents because they're greek scholars therefore he's real to them the archetype of achilles is real he's manifest he's real he's more real than some other people maybe that may even be in your life so all i'm trying to say is that what is real to each person is what, since we manifest our own reality, it's what we are manifesting, not what we're being told was reality. If, if you are someone who believes that you're going to manifest reality, 
you are manifesting all reality, past, present, and future. Because, you know, again, whether it's flat earth or not yeah. flat earth, what, how does that affect me on a daily basis? I don't know, you know? Uh, maybe if I'm going to go to the moon and, and do all that, it may, but today it doesn't <laughs> at all. Uh, the Taurus are the same. This is the, you know, the going, whatever. The two Taurus symbols are going to be there the same way, round or flat. Yeah, and, um, <laughs> and I mean, so, okay, here, here we got the universal seesaw. What are we looking at here? Are we looking at flat? I mean, we, I guess we could be looking from top view on a, at a flat plane, right? This is a Russell drawing right here. Inner, every sphere is of equal mass. <laughs> this is a Russell drawing. So what do you think he believes in? He believes every sphere is of equal mass. That's pretty wild right now. Yeah. Any change of potential in mass changes all its dimensions and its positions also change to conform. The constant of energy for the mass does not change as dimensions change. The lifting power of an expanded mass D equals the compression capacity of the contracting mass at B. All dimensions change in universal ratios. So here we have this direction of contraction toward appearance. And then we have the direction of expansion toward disappearance. So, you know, one thing that Russell would say, and that I know that he does say is he talks about Saturn. He says the one reason that Saturn has rings is because as we disintegrate, we begin to blow up in the middle. And that's what causes these rings, just as with people. <laughs> As they get older, they may get the spare tire. They may get the roundness of form as they begin to degenerate. So if you're, you know, again, the question, what does Russell believe? He believes in spheres. Now, whether or not he believes that the Earth's a sphere, he believes that the other planets are spheres. I know that for sure. Can you talk a little bit more about how like, it's condensed into squares? Because that's like really trippy. In the yeah interesting well if you look at this drawing here okay you see this circle oh okay you see this square it'd be the idea of taking a tennis ball and then taking a square box and shrinking it on the ball to where the ball would then lose its shape that ball would become cubic as the box shrank it would lose its its integrity and fill and fill the square and so that's based on how the vectors of light and force work upon the um the spherical the curved spherical planes that we talked about here what was that here what was that at Where was that one at? I forget where that one is. Oh, here, where it talks about this, this going on. So the sphere, from what Russell says, all these spheres compress into cubes, into a, four, uh, a, a, a dimensional. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we get through, as we get into the omnipresence. Because we'll talk a little bit more about space. But... This is kind of the diagram. If you want to actually know more about that, there's some good stuff on the, uh, philosophy, uh, the University of Philosophy and Science that Matt Presti put out. There's some really good videos on that. It'd take me really a long time to explain it all, but basically it's these cubes, these circles, spheres becoming squares as they are condensed into the three dimensions. That feels way more mind boggling to me than the flat earth, round earth. Thing. <laughs> well, exactly. Because well, I mean, that whole thing, a flat earth uh, a sphere, whatever uh, that is in the, in out there, 
it doesn't really help anybody, does it? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's kind of like, a, okay, <laughs> sure. But I mean, this is interesting. <laughs> I mean, this can, uh, can work in us for sure. <laughs> I totally love what you said, Will. Well, you know, I don't know how that affects my day-to-day -day life. I don't know how that really, if it's round or flat, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't really affect me that much. Or... And again, if you're going to get out on my diving board, right, I manifest it all anyway. You know, and either you believe that you're not manifesting, right, and there's a world out there that you're living in, or you believe that you are the creator being and everything you see, touch, smell, taste, interact with is your manifestation. Now, I'm not saying one's right, one's wrong, right? As I used to say, I used to listen to a Christian pastor that when he didn't, when he would give the facts and he would say, you know, this says this, this says that, this, he'd always get, well, I'd like to believe, right? Well, that's kind of me. I got these facts, I got, I'd like to believe I manifest everything. I'm no longer a victim. I'm in control. That's just how so, I want to live, you know. Well, if there was enough of us that thought that it was one way or the the other, then wouldn't we make it so? Mm -hmm. Just for, by for, our for for our reality. Yeah. Okay. For for our own individual. Again, you're manifesting me. You're manifesting a version of me. You're manifesting a version of Giselle. You're you're manifesting a version of everybody in this group. And I the same. You are unique to the one, but your own projector of what reality is, is unique to you. But it's still the one with multiple realities. But if, 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 if many of us all um, saw the same thing, felt the same thing, understood the same thing, we would affect the physical structure of reality? You, what you, you would affect this physical structure of your own reality. But if, if many of us all thought the same thing at the same but, time. But again, you're getting away from the idea of the one, <sighs> right? I'm going to have a, a personalized view of my world based upon my own unique <sighs> DNA, everything else that, that's part of me. What I'm trying to say is that when you look out on the world and and you may see this world as with cars and houses and roads, right? But that may be a different, if I was to go actually inside your head and be Pola, I might see something different than what I actually see. But because of the resonant signature that when I put that down on paper or I take a photograph, I will still see the re resonant signature of what was recorded in my own mind, my own way. I totally get that. I'm with you on that. But I think what Paul is getting at, and let me just like iterate on like the COVID-19 bullshit. Like mm -hmm. there's enough people that believe in the hysteria of it all. We're <laughs> in Portland where it created a lot of uh, an alternative reality. And then there's me who's like thinking, you guys are all nuts. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know how to do math? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You but know. That's like two different realities manifesting. Like you're saying but, that I created that. Well, well no, you know, I, I'm I, saying that you that you could have left that reality a long time ago. It's brainwashing. You could have left that reality. You you chose to stay in that reality in that location, which has its own resonance. Okay, wherever you're at on this planet, you're going to be picking up vibrations from the moon, the stars, the planets. Okay, you're picking up res resonance. I mean, this this all has an effect on who you are. Your location has an effect on who you are on a daily basis. And Where he's you... also going to be a beacon. Exactly. Wherever he is, just like you told us, you're going to be where you're going to be because it's going to do something. So I think we have chosen to be where we are right now because there's a purpose for it. And, and, I, and I'm not saying to leave. What, what I'm just saying no, is no, I understand. I'm just... that, that, that you've moved to a location where it's very, very... But that's a manifestation of you, 100%. And you can change your reality. Now, you know, is there archons and is there this other, you know, whole thing in the causal plane? Sure. We know there are, right? How does that affect my daily life? I don't know, because the only thing that I deal with is my reality, right? 
I don't deal with Paul Paul's reality when she's not around me, right? I don't deal with Brian's reality when he's not. Only thing I deal with is my reality on a daily basis. So what is the most important thing for me to influence? My reality. Now, is there a collective reality? I, you know, I've talked about, you know, what, I, what I'm trying to do in this channel is create almost like this, a renewed great white brotherhood that Blavatsky talks about. And I don't mean it's all men and, you know, it's some, you know, paternal organization. It's more of like an organization of manifestors that are trying to manifest. And, and we can talk about that a bit. And we're, let's, let's, let's go into that a bit. Okay. So let's, let's look at the next question here. And hopefully you guys are all finding this exciting and interesting. Completely. Um, okay. <laughs> um, what are the expressions of desire in the unfolding of an idea? Okay. They are experiences in decision. They are recorded upon the individual man as his own interpretation of the man idea, as well as the whole human race of man. Okay. So the way that we affect others is that from page 66, they are experiences in decisions. Right. They are recorded upon the individual man or woman as his or her own interpretation of the man idea. So this is of your own idea within your own head of how you're interpreting this, right? Each individual will have this as well as in the whole human race of man. Okay. Mm. So think about you have this collective unconscious, right? Which is source, which we are a drop of, right? We're not the entire thing, but our consciousness, which makes the drop, so if I'm a drop in the ocean and I turn myself red, will I have an effect on the entire ocean? Yeah. Minimal, right? I mean, there will be a red dot in the ocean. If you get half the ocean to do it, the ocean looks really red. It's not totally red, but there is a major change, right? It's but, like that's story with a butterfly no like it you know makes hurricanes on the other side of the world is that, is that related yes i mean back to the back to the theory of one right so as we make individual changes as each of us change our individual reality are we going to change the whole ocean i don't know well, you will, think you're, it, you're talking it, morphogenetic fields here well right? that's an, what's the next question oh okay Look at yeah, that. you're exactly Pretty right cool. you're exactly no that's that's how synchronicity works right wow so let's talk a little bit about epigenetics and morphogenetic fields right if people aren't aware of what epigenetics is it everybody here aware of epigenetics you know well okay. not that word okay. i i don't actually so here you go from lipton yeah so ah. so what bruce lipton's came up with is that he's kind of you know countered you know where bear works on the idea of terrain theory versus disease theory right bruce lipton works against the idea that we're a victim of our genetics He's saying that our genetics don't determine our bodies. They are blueprints. They are archetypes of a human body. They may carry archetypal characteristics from our parents, from these things, but that we can actually change those through our consciousness. So epigenetics is the study of how your behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way your genes work. Unlike genetic changes, epigenetic changes are reversible and do not change your DNA sequence, but they can change how your body reads a DNA sequence. So what you're doing is, this is, kind of the same thing about the nature of reality. 
there may be a reality, but how we read that is determinant upon our epigenetic view of how our body reads that sequence, that resonance that's out there. Because don't forget, we have everybody out there, but what are they all, what, what's their number one pr prime influence? The source, right? The same source going out. How we pick that source up and then how we translate that into a form is up to us entirely. And so a growing body of research suggests that trauma, like from extreme stress or starvation, among many other things, can be passed from one generation to the next. Here's how. Trauma can leave a chemical mark on a person's genes, which then can be passed down to future generation. Now, again, I just copied this off. If it was me, I would say trauma can leave a resonance, right? A digital signature on a person's gene. Again, energy makeup, you know, transistor, repository for that electrical current, that electrical signature, that digital resonance. And that can be transmitted down to future generations. So as we have this collective world, as we have, I mean, I'm going to be influenced by my, my reality will be influenced by my parents, right? It may be influenced by greater by people who have my own, my own similar genetic makeup, sisters, brothers, you know, so on and so forth, cousins. So all of that's resonating and reverberating, right? How is my antenna, my body, my mind, my receptors translating that into reality? So back to your question, Grant, you know, as we have this resonance that's building, you're in a very high resonant field where you're at right now. The ability for you to overcome it you know, like I said, the reason you moved there in the first place was something that dropped, or why you were born there. If you go back to what um, Stein, Steiner says, or even what Bear says, or other people, is that we chose to be born where we are today for some purpose, some exact purpose. So you may have chosen to be born where you are to encounter all the stress that you're encountering to grow you into a very special and strong person. Yeah, and that totally answers my original question when we started out. We were talking about, you know, God is, you know, you have man's desire and God's desire mm -hmm. and God's or uh, instinct, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, so then why is, if, if, if everything's driven by God's instinct, why is the world so effed up? Like, because mm -hmm. it's all God, right? Mm -hmm. but, but this answers it, like the, the epigenetics and, and basically we're here to heal our trauma and our and mm -hmm. perfect our DNA. Yeah. Yeah, correct. So back to what, you know, that Paul, Paul is insight, which was really great, right? You're talking about more genetic fields. Exactly. Right. That's what we're talking about. So morphogenetics are kind of the study of Rupert Sheldrake, which actually, if you study where he got it from, which was from um, William James to Whitehead, and then Sheldrake picked up on their work. So a morphogenetic field, a subset of a morphic field is a hypothetical, hypothetical again for the definition, biological and potentially social field that contains the information necessary to shape the exact form of a living thing as part of its epigenetics, so within more fields, we have the study of epigenetics also, and may also shape its behavior and coordination with other beings. See also more from Genesis. So within our bodies, within our resonance, right? I mean, and that's why I kind of like, like looking at it as more of energy than matter, right? That's why I call myself the energy hunters. To me, it's all about energy, right? Energy and resonance, you know, and the, these laws that we have. 
That's why I'm not a chemistry guy. I'm an energy guy. Um, that a morphogenetic field. So within Sheldrake studies, he'll say that a flock of birds, you know, or a school of fish, you know, how can they do that? How can they just turn all together like that? Mm-hmm. Right? Well, they're actually a social network. They're actually one organism. Mm-hmm. And man is one organism. And once we get back to believing that man is one organism and not separated by his physical (laughs) distinctions, then we will know love. There's there's two words in this morphogenetic field resonance uh, piece here that I'm having some questions about, and that is hypothetical biological. Well, why hypothetical? Well, again, that's, I, I took it off the internet. I'm not saying that this is my words, right? Because I, because in, 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 in modern science, I mean, in current science, they're not going to say that it's true. Oh, okay. Because, yeah, in my, my, in my understanding, I, uh, there is no hypothetical. It mm-hmm. is. It, mm-hmm. it, we've seen it in effect. Mm-hmm. And then at down the last line, and may also shape its behavior and coordination. It shapes our behavior mm-hmm. and coordination. No, so I, I just, I, I Yeah, guess no, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. I do agree. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm just saying that this is what the definition is off of the internet, right? And again, it's 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 clouded with materialism, of right? So no, I and I believe that that what you're saying is what Russell's saying, right? That that and the, what the, the law of one is saying. But again, I've never seen epigenetics and morphogenetic field resonance put together. It's they're they're pretty much one of the. I mean, yeah, they're di- right. a little bit different approach, but it's really on the DNA level versus where I don't know what where, where, where Sheldrake actually thinks it's being generated from. I've never really heard him talk. You know, he talks about it. He says that you know he talks about dogs and things and how their behavior. Like, he doesn't really you know he, you know I don't know if he's a biologist, right? I think he's a psychologist. I don't know. I don't know what he is. No, he no. He was a plant biologist, I think. Anyway, um, so you know, m- my theory is is that it's the, you know our DNA, the I raw, it's vibration, it's resonance, it's you know all these things, and that's how we create matter. You know, it's, it's the wave, right? It, I mean, this whole morphic field is really just the wave. It it goes back to um, you know, the, the biofield anatomy, right? This right here is a biofield scan of a person that they have now. We're actually seeing these colors and waves coming off people, you know. How far out does this go? To infinity and beyond, right? This is, this is who we are. This right here is not who we are. This is just our manifestation in this plane. This is actually who we are out here. All these colors, all these forms, all, all these waves. And, and this field is interacting with every other field of every other person. But we deal with this physical manifestation. And my theory is, and what I'm trying to do is deal with this for all these other people, right? How can I deal with this? I mean, this, dealing with this is what we do, but we get caught up with lots of traumas. We get caught up with lots of overlays. And and don't get me wrong, you know, Jung called it the um, relating function. You know, how can we relate to other people? Because once we get out here and we begin to see ourselves as this, we we, we may be seen as autistic <laughs> <laughs> or, beha- or behaviorally, you know, inept to most people. It sounds like a zombie. It's no, it's so true. When I witnessed my friend awaken, like he just had this like spontaneous awakening. And he honestly couldn't do much like in the physical world. He would just sit there and he, he needed help like just doing basic things. So it makes sense why, because you, you had to like reassimilate like where you, I don't know, it's, it's interesting. 
and there were or there are some enlightened people and i i think even what's his name um russell Crutt, that when he went into these trances people had to take care of him yeah because he actually left the body now i'm not saying that's something i want to do but i'm just saying that and i don't know if you have to do it but as we begin to and this paula when i was working with you this is what i was working with this is what I was trying to concentrate on. I was working with this part of your body, not this part of your body. So were you were you consciously um, emitting or were you conscious of what you, uh, you were I was putting, putting my, I was putting my intention on a different area. I was putting an intention three feet above your head. Ah, okay. To the wow. orb that's up there. That to but were you, were you thinking certain things? Because there was like no, content. I was, I, was, oh, I, I was talking to a part of your being that was not your physical existence. And so I was trying to relate three feet above my head with three feet above, it was an experiment. That's the first time I've really done it. <laughs> kind of nice. But I was trying to relate on that level versus on the conscious level. But you did respond. I mean, you, you did, and you lit up in a way that, you know, was different, right? Could you tell? Could, were you getting? Oh, well, yeah. Brian was there, you guys. It was Brian and Will and I. We were we had this neighborhood campsite together, oh. and all of a sudden something happened. We were talking, and then it was just like I don't know. There was no words. I, we just stopped talking, and Brian was sitting here, and then there was uh, Will and I were back and forth and th sitting this way, and Brian was here, and we were all aware of one another. There was no words for quite some time. And I went in, I, I was just like, I don't know what, I was just like hanging with Will. And I went into this, I could see a whole different matrix and dimension and went there. It was like a transmission. There was, he was like showing me, I, I felt like you were showing me. I wasn't sure, I don't know how to language it. I've not quite processed all of that yet. Well, I was trying to show you like my reality right which would be outside the so it'd be like if you were nemo right and you're hooked up inside and i come over and wake you up and say hey look at this and all of a sudden you kind of wake up and you go wow this you know i'm not in this bathtub right i'm outside you know looking at all this other stuff and that's what i was trying to manifest you know and I, again it was an experiment on my part so um, but it, can, I, can I ask you a question? Were you getting feedback that that I was at, that there was a resonance that I was actually understanding? Oh, and yeah. that I was because what happens is it's no longer me talking. And I've had it happen before when I've done like ministry, where I've had like God speak through me. Yeah, that, that's what that, that's that, what that's what it felt like, right? That's what it felt like to me too. There there was a, a divine something that was other that, that wasn't either one of our meat suits, there was another conversation going on and another direct knowing transmission going on and a showing and a little learning, a conscious mm -hmm. learning. If yeah, and I was gonna say, I was just gonna joke, I don't wanna ruin the moment, but this is the same night we're having the margaritas. <laughs> no, this okay. was the night before. Okay. Sorry. And then I'm sitting there just turning my head back and forth between these two people going, something's going on and I guess I'm still here. So <laughs> maybe I should leave. No, I guess I shouldn't. <laughs> but this is kind of like the physics of an experiment where you have the observer. Okay. And also- and You said that once before. Yes. And also like in esoteric traditions, like with Jesus where two or more are gathered, right? And I mm -hmm. think that third person serves as the witness which mm -hmm. I think if you're gonna do this type of work, it helps to have that third person as a witness. Mm -hmm. Well, the witness because, influences the, the, what the, the observer, yeah. uh, influences the observed, what they're observing. Yeah, and, and so I think that it's kind of, and Brian, that's his nature is that he is a librarian, a watcher, or a recorder. Mm. So it's almost like it was a perfect storm that was set up. Felt like that too. Yeah. yeah. So wow. it's gonna be a good spot, eh? Yeah, well, you know, we were at Earth and we were at Earth and, and music and music and sky. So there was a lot of good resonance. We were in nature, right? We're sitting on the ground, you know, had our feet grounded. So wow. it, was, it was a very yeah, it was a good time. You know, it was a good it was good lab conditions. You know, for what we were doing, yeah. everything was set up. 
so yeah so that that was pretty cool so you're so, saying it happened in in those outer fields the the you're saying that that's what, that where i was that's that's where i was trying to work and again i've kind of learned this from my tuning fork work and from my biogeometry and what i'm finding is is that I, the more skilled I get at using the tools, the less I need the tools and the more I can do with my intention. And, yeah. uh, and so it's, but by having the tools, they kind of help you to hone your skill to, to have, to have your intuition begin to feel and to experience what you're trying to accomplish. And like I said, you know, being involved with ministry in the past where I've done like, you know, where I felt this presence before speaking through me, not you know, almost channeling in a sense. Um, but not channeling the spirit, just kind of channeling, channeling energy. Um, that you begin to develop and hone that skill. And that's what I'm trying. And that's what I'd really like to see happen in this group, yeah. maybe, yeah. Is, is to begin to influence the causal plane like you said you know i was just gonna say that's the causal plane right yeah exactly and you were working directly with me on the causal plane i was trying to and that's so that's one thing that russell speaks about is this cause and effect and we don't want to be caught up in effect you know we want to be caught in cause we, we want to be <sighs> concentrating on cause and feeling this energy and working on at this level if we can as above so below and you know, I had no idea if it was going to work or not, really. I mean, I hadn't done it before <laughs> for that way, but it did, you know. It and, did. Yeah. And you were ready. And, you know, so that was good. Hungry, voracious. Yeah. yeah just exactly. like, give me a few more minutes here. I'm, you know, just mm -hmm. let me just like, I just need a little more time. You know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, it, it's working. Wow. So, so, you know, and, and we did have an observer, so hopefully it all it all was real. It was real. You you did learn, like I said, you got the first three chapters. Um, <laughs> first three chapters. Uh, so, what does Walter um, Russell define in? How does Walter Russell define instinct? Again, a cell memory record of all actions of a body, and all the sensations caused by those actions. Instinct is a God control over the action of his creation. So even our instincts, right? We have no control really over our instincts. They are God controlled or source controlled. I mean, are, do, you, do you think about breathing? Do you think about where the, how the vitamin B or C or D gets to your liver and is separated out <laughs> and goes into your bloodstream? Or how your gallbladder, you know, creates bile that goes in. We do none of those things. So, you know, well, the people say, well, it's just the body. Well, how's the body know? Is it sentient? Is the body sentient in that way? Is it? Is does it have this cell memory recorded in all action of the body? Or is it actually being controlled by source? Right. It just seems too weird that everybody works so perfectly. And it seems strange that as we get farther and as more and more of the world becomes material and look, looks at materialism, that we're seeing more and more disease. Well, we're no longer in balance. Eh? Yeah, we're, we're, lo we're losing archetypes. We're losing contact with source. We're losing contact with disease. being human. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do we need nature. to worry? No. Go ahead, Brian. I'm, I'm just, I have an instinct <laughs> to, to suggest that maybe we need to be worrying about Grant in his Portland okay. arena with well, his field impacted by all of these other fields. Well, again, worry, just, doesn't, worry doesn't accomplish it, anything. No, worry okay. is a waste of energy right we can support grant okay but you know we can support grant yes and, we, and, and we, we can need, recognize yeah, that, we that, that grant may need support but again worry is not yeah. a word that i want to use because worry is based on fear i agree 
And when, I agree. That's and not when, the right word. And when we're in fear, that's what causes the resonance to change. The forces that we don't want to participate in is fear and greed and worry and despair. Right. We don't, we don't, those are not the, the feelings of an empowered divine being. Right. The source is never fearful, right? Or it shouldn't be. If it is, then, you know, we're all doomed. <laughs> we're <lost. laughs> right? We're all lost, right? So yeah. um, I think to support Grant, you know, with intention, again, it's like, again, like I said, the great white brotherhood, in a sense, and I'm not, you know, there's a lot of, you know, connotation that goes with that term, you know, that, you know, cult and, you know, we're the Rothschilds and all that. Do I think that people may be using these things, you know, against us? I, I think you were talking about Paula, you know, the unseen war or whatever. Sure. I'm sure that there could be beings that are manifesting things. And we're picking up on that resonance out here. Okay. So we're picking it up on this field out here and then we're bringing that down and then we're manifesting it. If you understand what I'm saying. It's not like it's being manifested by them here. We're picking it up out here, right? In the ocean of the Akasha. We're picking it up in the Akasha and then we're bringing it down and manifesting. So what we got to do is affect the Akasha, right? We got to affect the ocean with our intention, with our thoughts. As we have ideas of worry come in, words like that, we get rid of them. Right? We do what's on your shirt. We concentrate on truth, love, and freedom. Those are the words of a divine being, right? Not fear, remorse, despair, victimology. Those aren't our words. Because we want to manifest in the causal plane and have that as above, so below, go down. It's like the trickle down theory, right? But we don't want trickle down, we want gush down theory. <laughs> well, can't you feel, I thought well, the last, I don't know, last three or four weeks, I, I just, I've been feeling a lot more um, love flowing um, in the people I work with or, you know, in Quartal, um, even in alphabetic, I'm just saying, I could feel it. And, I mean, I'm feeling it anyway. And I, and again, so, you know, when you get back to Jung, he called it the collective unconscious, you know, other people called it, you know, the Akasha, whatever. Um, is it real? I believe that that's real, right? But I, but that's mm -hmm. our, re that, that's our co collective reality is the collective unconscious. The physical is kind of our manifestation of all of our filters being brought down from the collective unconscious. So if we can change our interaction at that level, we can change our reality at this level. Okay, let's see here. Cell memory, God controlled. Does any of the creation have the ability to think to think at the beginning of their power. Does any creation have the ability? No, okay. So does any creation have the ability to think at the beginning of their power? So when we're first, when a creation is first born or brought into existence, right? So what Russell's alluding to here is that we're being reincarnated many times, right? Because from page 68, no, it takes millions of years for complex organisms to recognize the spirit within them to think at all. So it takes time. So right now where we're at, right, this is this evolution. This is this changing. We're growing. And we are now beginning to understand and realize, and we're seeing things differently. The world could have always been the way that it is right now. We just now are seeing it differently. Mm -hmm. Because our consciousness is changing. Our awareness is changing. I mean, you... <laughs> You know, if you want to talk about history and movies, man, you watch some, you know, we don't have anybody on galley ships, right? <laughs> I know of. You know, I don't see women being naked serving me fruit, right? That'd be kind of a bad thing. That's what it used to be, right? 
So is this reality worse than it was then? I don't know. Yeah, to go to Epstein's Island and check it out. Yeah, I mean, we don't, I, I don't see anybody with shackles on their legs. Um, you know, I don't see slave markets. I mean, it is a different reality. Is it better or worse? I'm not going to say it's any better because there are still people suffering. There is still injustice in the world, iniquity. But is you're it worse? Right. Huh? You're totally right, though. Like, the whole game's changed. Like, even the common law stuff Paula talks about, it's like they're still following uh, law, right? So, like, <laughs> they're not, like, sure, there's, like, murder and death and stuff but it's not like as overt like you're saying like out it's, in the open it's more of a mind trap now it's a choice yeah it's a choice and and that's what i'm saying is that you're in an area where your choices seem less but some of that is it, how differently are you living right now than you were before i mean you just went to Earth, music and sky you took a week off you didn't wear a mask you Right, I'm going to come up there and never see wear you. A mask. Huh? I never wear a mask. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So how much has your life really changed? Well, I've had to confront a lot of uh, fears, so it's good, I guess. But that's so you're growth. in the perfect place for that. Yeah. yeah. And if if you weren't confronting those fears, you'd just be conforming and not growing. And, you know, the same thing happened to many cultures over time, right? When... The, Jew, the Romans came in and conquered. Again, if history is correct, I don't even believe, like I said, I don't know if I believe history, right? But as the Romans came in and took over the Jews in Jerusalem, they had to conform or die or decide that they were going to, the Maccabees stood up. You know, there was different times, and this these could be times where our consciousness as a group can elevate, can separate or it can elevate. When we separate, we lose. When we embrace oneness, we can elevate. And I'm not talking about becoming spiritual beings only. I'm talking about becoming enlightened physical beings that have a different way of living in the physical plane. Mm -hmm. You have a comment still? <laughs> Just gestating here. There's something that there's about the, um, you know, I understand that we human beings are a living anthropology of all life forms that have existed before mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. and that we are in the quote unquote six mass extinction, mm -hmm. and that all the answers in us are are to our personal, professional, and global challenges are within us, and that it's this. There, there's something about this um, millions of years of complex organ for it takes millions of years. It, it's there's something about this inversion process and this alchemization process of mm -hmm. what what we are and this the consciousness of those single celled organisms to come together to become something more complexly unified and organized and into different life forms birthing different life forms. It feels like we are actually at that stage in some way as a human species in, 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 in recognizing the, it, but on an inversionary level, I'm, I don't I'm just as new what I'm thinking right mm -hmm. now. So there's something, if we were to take that in that sentence and turn it uh, the other way, that maybe human beings right now are learning that that one, one it's just inverted. I don't know if I didn't, wasn't very articulate, but does that make any sense? Yeah, and it's almost a little bit about leaving the current Christian era of a weak and compliant God of Christ that we see, that I don't believe was the true Christ, to mm -hmm. talking about what Grant's talking about now of standing and holding our ground. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was talking to my alchemy teacher there. And he says that he believes that we've been in the you know, time of Aquarius since the 19 <coughs> or 18 somethings, right? Whenever flight came into existence, because Aquarius, I guess, is an air sign. And all the things that have been happening with the air, like flight and radio and TV, right? So he believes that we've been in the Aquarian age for quite a while. And it's not like we're transitioning into that. We're almost like in the middle of the Aquarian age. So, 
we've been going through this transition of going into air beans over, you know, water beans for a while from the, from the land of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. So we are going to begin to change as we go into what they call this information age, right, or whatever, which is really the age of the air. And we really haven't just embraced that or recognized it. We're still saying we're going into it when we've been in it for 100 years. And it, well, there's also we're moving into ecclesiastical law, mm -hmm. which is in the, the spiritual domain, the um, digital crypto, mm -hmm. you know, domain. And that's really the, the, the age of the air, right? No information. Can you do that again, Paula, one more time. You said it a little. That was really Ecclesia, what? We're, 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 well, the um, Pope and Queen have bankrupted all of their uh, corporations globally too many times in the Admiralty Sea jurisdiction. There's land, air, water, law. And so they're, they're, they, they, they can't do, stay in the sea jurisdiction anymore. They can't go onto the land because we, the living people, are there. And so their only place to go is into the air, which is ecclesiastical law, which is a form of um, canon law or civil law. And I mean, they're coming for our souls at some level, right? And and at another level, there's a whole other level of opportunity, I believe, there. So it's so, so again, that goes back into what I was saying about we're already in the age of Aquarius, which is it, the age of air. We've left the age of the sea, which is Pisces, right? We were in the yep. age of Aries or Mars, which was the age of the land during the Greek times. And right, now, so they think that they're going to take our souls, but th there's another thing going on, like with what you're doing here, Will, and that's, you know, mastering this causal plane, mm -hmm. and they got another thing coming, because we're trinary systems, and we can do this, and mm -hmm. we are doing this, and we've actually already done it. Mm -hmm. And, but the techniques to do this are much different than the techniques of the past. And that's really what I'm trying to explore and develop, right? through this one's awareness, right? Finding like-minded individuals to, to actually provide tools and support for our brothers and sisters in the areas that need it, like, like Grant, as, as Brian has said, and to allow us to actually grow in the causal plane. Even help Doug there. Yeah. It, it, aren't you in Queens, Doug? Or whatever it's called. He's not hearing. Sorry. Yeah, he's he's on mute. You're on mute, Doug. I'm outside Manhattan. I'm three miles from the uh, Empire State Building. But I'm saying he's in the well. Don't need any help. The way he described where he lives and how it's become. Let me tell you, he's made a big. Uh, well, he's made like a, an oasis of stillness at mm -hmm. your particular place, but around you. Nobody understand what you're talking about, for sure. Uh, hopefully. And That's the, the choice is run away to another country or stay here. Nah, I think, yeah. You, you could move to Florida. Uh, yeah, I, I could. <laughs> no, I could move to a lot of places. I, you know, but I almost moved to, there's a big flat road right down the block from, uh, from Bear. Oh yeah, you wanted to go. What he meant when he discovered alphabetic, he wanted to move where Dr. Barr was. Dr. I still Linda. do. I'm waiting for them yeah. to. I'm waiting for this thing to blow up if the price goes down. Okay, well, maybe. Well, man, they're turning. Uh, they're turning Manhattan into a, a smart city, and you know, it, it just looks <laughs> like massive five G. So I would think that getting yeah. together with Will and having one of those, you know, um, you know inner matrix dialogues where you can just like you know move through the causal plane and shape shift in some way to um mitigate the uh, unconventional warfare that is on your front doorstep yeah, i'm not in manhattan though and i have and i have been buying all that orgone stuff and i have you know, these mm -hmm. shields you know <laughs> and again and, I, and it, it has it, it's gonna work because i know it's gonna work and that's good enough and it Again, does work. And I, I think that for our growth, we need the dark, right? We need so well, luckily, 
And again, I'm willing to sacrifice my being, right, to see if I can actually create what I'm saying. Because <laughs> if, if I can't, and I, then I really don't want to be here either. <laughs> Let it take me, you know. But I would rather, because I'm Aries and I'm a warrior, right, fight for staying here and making this a beacon as just, I have the tools, I have the knowledge, right? Yeah, there you kind go. Kind of like this, you know, six million dollar man. We can rebuild him. You know, <laughs> if you're old enough to remember that one, right? Yeah, no, I'm not old enough to kind of rebuilding him. That's, that's what we're all against. You know? uh, but we can, uh, you know, we have biogeometry, we have transmutation, you yep. know, and if we can actually incorporate those tools and actually transmutate, as either it's real or it's not. Either we can do these things or we can't. That's why, I don't, that's why I don't live in fear. Yeah, I mean, I was living in fear, but not anymore, thank God. So um, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't, you know, pursue a private society or other things. Again, I don't, we, you know, I live in the world. I don't, you know, I, I am of the world. I, I live in it, but I'm not of it, right? So you have to do things. You still got to pay some taxes. You still got to do some things to, to make. Yeah, I'm life. trying to get around those taxes thing. Make your life bearable, but I do think that the I don't think that's the answer. I think that's you know what in technology you call a bridge technology, right? It gets you to the next phase, and the next phase to me is working in the causal plane. It's amazing the fear that people that you know some of these people in the company that I I consult with is just unbelievable. The, the, how scared they were to go out of their own house. One, one guy announced on the call, it wasn't on the call, in, in October, uh, I, I went out and walked down to the corner today. Wow. I was like, what the fuck is he talking about? You know, I, didn't, I didn't understand even. And someone explained it to me that he hasn't gone out of his house since October. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so question 11. Can man know all things and have all power okay mm. for walter russell yes wow to the extent that he wishes to know <laughs> all things and be all powerful good answer <laughs> well what what is that what is it the extent that he wishes and that that desire when we put yes to the extent of his desire to know all things and be all powerful. So doesn't that kind of imply that um, all knowing is really just a frequency that we tune into? So it's like a radio station kind of thing and we're just like um, tuning into it or not tuning into it? Yes, Grasshopper, you are very wise. <laughs> you probably don't know that reference either. Yes, you are exactly right. You are exactly right. You are, you, I got the reference. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's an old TV reference. Yeah. Um, you tell my generation. Um, uh, yes. So, you in order in or once we once we as people, and this is what Walter Russell said: stop trying to think electric thoughts from our sensing body, and think that that is us, and be driven by the desires. And I'm not saying it's not good to love somebody or have, you know want sex or have a beer. I'm not saying all that. Just, but once those begin to control us, right? Once those, the the need for comfort, the need for, you know, gluttony versus just eating to you know feed ourselves or whatever, then that becomes us. That becomes our ego, maybe our super ego, and we lose all sense of knowing. And we're being told that no, you know, knowing is not sitting in a quarter and trying to have clairvoyance. You're not capable of that. And what I'm saying is, yes, I mean, it's been proven. I mean, through these other projects they've done with remote viewing and other things they've done in the military, yes, clairvoyance is a reality. It can be done. I thought you were saying it couldn't. I was losing. No, no. I mean, with the remote viewing stuff, they are doing it. I mean, in the military, it's it's pretty much known fact um so it's really like you know what battlefield do you want to fight and i just know i've i've fought a lot and 
there's always someone bigger, faster, stronger, you know. Um, but in the causal plane, you know, we all have equal abilities if we choose. And I don't think there's that many people developing those abilities right now. Some are, but they're, you know, even people I know that meditate quite a bit still live in fear. So their effect is not going to be as great as those that don't have fear and who work in those arenas, in my opinion. I have a question about the difference between channeling and like channeling our higher soul selves or channeling um, and this causal plane. Mm -hmm. Well, again, as I've talked about in the past, and this really gets into, you know, cosmogenies or cosmologies or whatever you want to call it. When we look at this diagram of source, right? Is God the only thing that affects us? Is God the only spiritual being that affects us? And my answer is no. The moon's a spiritual being. The sun's a spiritual mm. being. Venus is a spiritual being. You know, the plants are a spiritual being. You're a spiritual being. We, and when you read, and you weren't here, we talked about Emanuel Swedenborg, but, you know, Swedenborg's thing was that we're constantly being influenced by if you want to call them angels or angles or whatever you want to call them, you know, or archons, or you can, we can call them whatever we wish, but we have influences that are affecting that DNA strand. Negative too, though, right? Mm. Again, it's, again, I don't want to get into positive and negative. What I'm just saying is they're telling us stuff. Well, evil also. How's that work? I, I don't, again, we're going to get to the last question and then we'll talk about evil. But let me just say that we are be, constantly being influenced by resonances and what we desire will be what we decide we are going to tune into or what we're going to hone our, our radio to do, you know, yes, it's hard. It's hard for me. I mean, if you say, well, we're the missionaries that came to the United States and killed all the Indi Indians, you know, evil. Well, if you're, a, if you're a Catholic, probably not. If you're an Indian, probably. <laughs> you know? So good and evil sometimes is hard to discern based on, it's based on your own belief system at the time. And whether or not you think you're doing good or bad, you know, some people, you know, are, are sincere in their beliefs, but they're sincerely wrong. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that they're evil. It just means that what they thought they were doing, they weren't. Or they were being used for God's purposes, and I don't know why. You know, so that's why I don't really get involved with good and evil. But back to Paul's question, what is channeling? Channeling can be to where you're actually trying to not channel God, but channel sources that could be if you think it's your grandmother or Napoleon or Hitler or whatever, you know, you're going out into the Akasha and trying to pick up spirit beings or spirit resonances to accomplish a different purpose. What was the name of that author? Emmanuel something? Uh, Emmanuel Swedenborg. Swedenborg. He's from the 1800s. Um, and so what he did was he did breath work and he went actually into heaven where he spoke with angels and demons and things. So he says, but he was a well-known person. He was well-respected. He was a mining engineer and so on. Um, but within that he had conversations and, you know, pretty enlightening. And then he, uh, reinterpreted the Bible for that time very differently than what was being taught. So you can channel. You know, I, it's not something I want to practice. When I said I channeled with you, I was trying to channel source, you know. Um, and that was what my intent was on. That's what my desire was on. And that's about the best I can do, is put my desire and my intent on what I believe to be source. And I think the more we meditate, the more we do inner work, the more source becomes clear to us. Uh, it goes back to your original question, the first question you asked, right? The knowing of what was the first question? What does organic matter really generate from? Oh, uh, wait. 
That's not. I, I think it's probably from from probably from this is where the yeah, still magnetic yeah. universe of God, knowing which is invisible, unchanging, unconditional, and unmeasurable. Right. So let's let's we're getting kind of long in the tooth here. Let me just finish up with the last question. Okay, so can man know all things? Yes, right? We have that ability. That's very powerful, right? How powerful is that? Can man be apart from God? From page 69, no, nor can any part of creation be apart from God at any time. So, <sighs> talking to Doug, if he's still there. I'm in. Can evil be apart from God? If it's not a creation, it's not part of the creation. How can it not be part of the creation? God creates I everything. Know. I don't know. Maybe that's why it's called evil. No, it's I all part. Not. It's all part. All part and parcel. If it's outside of God, then God's not God. Yeah, for me, evil just is a permission issue, right? Like, <laughs> comes down to permissions. Um, it's a desire issue. What do you desire? Do you desire to do things that in your knowing is harmful to others? Right? If you yeah, but that so same desire, if, if it was given freely by the other person, it wouldn't be considered evil. It's only considered evil if the other person doesn't want to give it to you or they don't exactly. know taking it. Exactly. And again, I'm not saying sex or things like that, right? I mean, that, that, those are connotations that people put to evil or put to uh, what I'm saying is is that I have watched more evil on TV than I've experienced myself. I have read more evil than I've experienced myself. Now, I'm not a cop, and you know, and I'm not an emergency room nurse, and I'm not a trauma therapist, right? But I know I have been told of more evil than I have experienced myself. And so my view of evil in the world is much greater, and that's what sells the news. Evil sells the cat being saved from the tree is not going to sell one newspaper, not going to get one person to tune in or click on me. You know? It feels like the evil is live, spelled backwards. It just feels mm. like one more of those sacred inversions or polarizations are part of the same whole. Mm -hmm. We can't, yeah. And again, I'm not saying that bad things don't happen to people. I'm not saying that there isn't things that are against people's will that happens that, um, but my whole point being is that it is all in the God box. Because if it's not, then God's not God. There's another God who's controlling action. And we have duality and Satan's his own God. And to say that good will win, it's a crapshoot then. It's a crapshoot, whichever God's more well, powerful. I don't know. I mean, there could be, uh, you know, people that split off and that are his good and bad have to balance, no? I mean, there could be evil that's overweighing good, and we need it to balance back the other way. Well, I mean, that's again, what it feels like. It feels like it's evil, a little bit more, too much on the evil side right now to me. Well, again, and that's what you said is feel, right? For me, personally, my life has not changed that much on the evil side. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't watch. Seen, I don't watch the news. I don't know. either. I've seen more personally than I have from TV. Yeah, and so, you know, I haven't seen any evil. Luckily, you know, luckily I have not been been viewing that. I haven't been seeing all this evil going on. Um, and again, if it's a manifestation of myself, what am I doing in the causal pain to change that manifestation? Am I being yeah. a victim of this evil or am I actually trying to manifest something in a causal plane? And do I believe what Thank I'm saying? God I wasn't in it. You know, am I, do I believe what I'm saying? Or am I just for, you know, junk? And it's just words to me. No, I'm, I'm trying to manifest. Do I do it every day? No. But when I do, I have this group, right? I'm trying to manifest things. Without a doubt. You know, I, I'm, I'm trying to manifest. So, um, so that's, I, I don't, and you know, like I said, Walter Russell says there is no evil, only good, right? So Abram Kareem says the same thing. Those are two of my enlightened people that I listen to. Um, 
So that's the path I choose. That's where I put my desire. That's where I put my intention. And, you know, everyone else has free will. They can put their desire and intention where they wish also. But my, my desire, my intention is to find like-minded people that want to try to manifest in a causal plane and find the tools, techniques, and methods to make that happen. That's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I, I, mean, I just don't want to see any more of, you know, other people hurting other people and just standing around watching it happen because you can't, you feel like you can't do anything. I feel like it's a necessary part of our human growth experience and that all the darkness is really creating incredible uh, um, learning opportunities for us all. Absolutely. Yes. You know, and that trauma is something that we our our souls create through our subconscious mm -hmm. so that we can learn, grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think that, you know, it's fucking hard, though. Yeah, again, it, no, it's, well, growth isn't easy. And that's that's what I've talked about is that, you know, you can't sharpen a sword with a bar of soap, right? <laughs> I mean, you need some friction. Yeah, that's good. You know, and if we if we want to, if we want to grow, oh, the then, cat. <laughs> then then we we need that friction, and the only way we get that friction is from the dark or for evil or for whatever whatever's against our will, you know. And so we need that. Uh, we need, and God needs mm -hmm. that in, or, in order for Him to actually grow as a um, uh, in the material realm, because for some reason. He couldn't grow in the material realm without creating us. So, they don't call it the great awakening for nothing. That's exactly. right. So, you know, embrace it, right? This is, you know, I mean, it's, you, know, you yeah. guys are old enough to know, remember the old sticks out in the grand illusion. I mean, this is the grand illusion. Go on in and see what's happening. Definitely the best time of my life. Pay right. the price to get a ticket to the show. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I tell people that that are like flipping out. I'm like, it's been the best 18 months of my life. They're like, what the fuck? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we can relate to it, Doug. It's just, yeah. you know. No, and I, again, oh, I'm not. A know. lot of people have said it, though. I mean, I, I know other people. So, like you said, it's an awakening. All this shit showed up. All right. So, that was the last question of the day, which is. It you know, last two questions were pretty good, right? We are, we can be all powerful and that nothing happens without being part of God. What else do we need, right? Sharpen our sword to some soap. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, I'll see everybody uh, next week, same time. I'll put out, you know, the questions hopefully beforehand. We'll, we'll be doing chapter 13. Looks like we're only, I'm trying to do maybe a chapter a week because I think it, it needs it. To actually, you know, consume it, um, and uh, that's it. Thank now. you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Will, uh, and everybody. This has just been a, an incredible um, experience for me today. Thank you. Very inspiring too. Thank you for all your support, and thanks for being here, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Love Thank it. You. I love it. <laughs> yeah. All yeah. Right. Me too. I'll definitely see you all next week. Yeah, and, yeah. and I'll, I'll be putting out little tidbits and things. I know that um, there's a fellow that I met at uh, Music and Sky who's an electrical engineer who was asking to do some, uh, oh, yeah. maybe a special session on uh, Rife and Scalar and Frequency. And I would like to do that with him because he is an electrical engineer. So again, that's not my expertise. I'm an architect, but I know enough just to be dangerous, just to be loosely coupled. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. So it's interesting uh, stuff. I'll, I'll put yeah. that out. Okay. Thank you. Okay, yep. guys. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.